And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament book of Acts. The New Testament book of Acts and Acts in chapter number 8. The book of Acts in chapter number 8. We're continuing with our series of how we got our English Bible, the history of the Bible, and we've been taking our time in bite-sized pieces to be able to process the information, to learn more about it. We took a time to talk about preservation. We took a session to explain the terms. We began to explain about the um, ancient Greek manuscripts, how they went there, how we had proof and evidence that they existed in the first place. Then we started to talk about the church of Antioch and how God had used that church as the headquarters of Christianity. And don't forget that we're going to refer to it a couple times today and how that was the center of Christianity and what God was doing, sending out missionaries, keeping the Bible, teaching people the right doctrine. Then we switched over and began to see the source of corruption and began to see how uh, people began to try to manipulate the Bible for their own uses. And it wasn't the idea that it was an updated language. It was actually a changing of doctrine to reflect their beliefs as they purposely tampered with the Bible. And so now we have two separate lines. We have the preserved line that came from Antioch and then the corrupted line that had been changed and manipulated that sprung up from uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and had crept into the Roman Empire, the Roman Church. Now, with that being said, we would like to start in the book of Acts, chapter number 8, and kind of see how this corruption went in, and how we could see the the um, comparison inside of our Word of God. But before we do anything, let's take some time and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God, and thank you for the great privilege it is to be in your house today to learn more about your word. I'm asking that you would set things in order. Let this be clear, not only in my mind, but in the way that we communicate it, that could be a help to people to have a better understanding of history, to have a better understanding of how these things came to be, and we want to keep things simple so that way we can increase our faith that this is indeed the very Bible that you intended us to have. Increase our faith, Lord. Thank you. Fill me with your spirit and that you would just settle me, help me to be dependent upon you, and that you get your own work accomplished tonight. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you don't mind and you found your way to the book of Acts chapter number 8, I want you to look with me starting at verse number 35. Acts chapter 8 verse 35, and it's very important for me that you take your own copy of the Word of God and look for yourself so that way when we do some comparisons, you have a better understanding, you can see it for yourself. Notice with me in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now, at this time, Jesus or Philip is talking to the Ethiopian eunuch and that God by his spirit had brought Philip from a revival out into the middle of the desert just to talk to this one man. And in this conversation, the man had gotten a Bible. He was trying to read it for himself. And he says, I don't understand what I'm reading. Philip says, let me help you. And starting from that same scripture, he began to preach to him Jesus. Verse number 36. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Good question. Verse 37. It says, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. Verse number 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the, or into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, this is a very important passage that as Philip is talking about salvation to the eunuch. He talks to the eunuch, and the eunuch says, all right, well, as I'm applying what you're saying, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Verse number 37 is very key, where it says that you first have to believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior. And the eunuch admits, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's a very big deal, that he had to have a profession of faith before he was baptized. Now, knowing what we talked about last week about origin 
and talked about these type of things, let's see what other versions have to say concerning this passage. If you don't mind, first of all, let's look at the RSV, the Revised Standard Version. And notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number 36 of what it says in the RSV. Now, we want to compare scripture. It says in verse number 36, Acts 8, 36 of the RSV, and as they went down along the road, they came to a water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What is to prevent my being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they went down into the water and Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now in the RSV, notice something. Verse number 37 is missing. The whole entire verse is missing. Well, somebody says, well, that's a liberal Bible. Why don't we look in a conservative Bible? Okay, well, then let's look at the NIV and let's see what it has to say. In Acts chapter 8, verse 36, in the NIV, it says, And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in my way of being be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Once again, Verse number 37 is missing inside of the NIV. Now remember, as we looked for ourselves, verse 37 is very key. What hinders me to be baptized? You first must accept Christ as your Savior. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That is a big deal. Now, inside of the footnotes, if you notice that each one of them had a marking of a footnote. So... The NIV has a footnote with a verse. In the footnote, uh, sorry, the NIV has a footnote that just has the verse. So if you look down below, they have the entire verse. It's a footnote instead of the text. In the footnote of the RSV, it states, other ancient authorities add all or most of verse 37. That's what they have in their footnotes. Now there's something we could draw as a conclusion for that. Both the NIV and the RSV translators knew the verse was available. They just chose not to add it. Well, that's a big deal. They knew it was available, and it was their choice not to add it. Why not? This all goes back to origin. Rather than translate the scriptures, Origen produced a translation with his views and his interpretations that were found therein. Remember, we had talked about that, that Origen didn't believe in certain things, and he developed a translation of the text that would reflect his views. So therefore, when people come to these other views and they said, listen, we don't really believe that you have to be baptized to be saved. We don't like that verse. Well, Origen didn't have it. So guess what? We're not going to include it either. It is a purposeful, intentional choice. Now, let's kind of give a review of what we talked last week about Origen. Origen produced a book called the Hexapola. Remember that this is a book that had seven or six columns in one page. So one big page, one column here, one column here, six columns all the way across. In the first column is the Hebrew Masoretic text. Now this is where we would get our Old Testament from. This is the good text. In column two, it was a Greek transliteration, meaning that he just still used the Hebrew word. He just put the, the Greek suffixes to the word, just basically Greekified that same word. In column three, it was a Greek translation from Aquila. And the fourth one, it was uh, another translation of Semiacus that updated Aquila's work. In column number six, you had a Greek translation of Theodotion, which once again was an update. And then in column number five, this was important. It was what is known as the Septuagint. The Septuagint was actually Origen's work. According to him, he called it the 70 or the LXX, the 70. He claimed that this work was the Old Testament Greek translation that was produced by 72 Hebrew scholars hundreds of years before Jesus. He claimed that it was about 250 B.C. By the way, there is no evidence of this. This is Origen's own work. He made it in 250 A.D. He took the Hebrew Old Testament, he translated it to Greek, and he revised the Hebrew Old Testament to match the philosophy of Philo and of Plato. Remember, he had a different philosophy, and he purposely changed the text as he went along. Then when he translated the New Testament, those New Testament uh, would have the reflection of his Old Testament revisions. So when Origen would come to a scripture that prophesied the virgin birth, something he didn't believe in, he would rewrite it. 
and then it would be reflected in the New Testament. If he came across something that made reference to God being manifest in the flesh, which is something he didn't or couldn't believe, he would rewrite it. So our Bible comes out of the first column. All the new Bibles come out of the fifth column, which is Origins work, which is again where we just saw in Acts. It's a reflection of that philosophy. We're going to talk more about that. We, we spent time with this last week. We're going to go off of that same idea and see now as these two different lines are completely separate and how they're going to travel throughout the ages of history. We, of course, know that that fifth column is going to become the basis of the Alexandrian text. Now, I've made reference to that Alexandrian text several times now. Let's define where these came from and what exactly happened. Now, remember, the origin of this is origin. The source of it is origin. From origin's work, other people are going to build off of that idea. So after... Out of the entire Hexapola came the work of Jerome with his Latin Vulgate or his Latin translation. And out of the fifth column of origin, known as the Septuagint, came the work of Eusebius. We're going to cover these two gentlemen today of Jerome and Eusebius. What these men produce is going to be the anti-Bible, the replacement Bible, or the counterfeit Bible from about 325 A.D., all the way up to the present time. So these are going to be some big people who are going to have a great influence. Eusebius and Jerome built upon the foundation of Jer origin. And upon the foundation of Eusebius and Jerome are built the position of every person using an NIV, a New American Standard, Revised Standard Version, Old World Translation of the... Um, of Jehovah's Witnesses, the M-I-C-K-Y, M-O-U-S-E, the everything else that comes out are going to be based off of their work, which is based off of Jerome. So let's cover Eusebius first. Constantine, who became the Roman emperor, hired Eusebius to undertake the task of preparing 50 official Bibles on the finest vellum. So basically, he hired him and said, Eusebius, this is what I want you to do. I, I want you to come up with 50 different Bibles, and we're going to pick which ones we want, okay? These were going to be the Bibles for the entire Roman Empire. Now, remember, Constantine, when he became the Roman emperor, legalized Christianity. In fact, pretty much ordered everyone to be Christians. So now we have to get Bibles, because remember, Diocletian, the person before him, had destroyed all the Bibles. Now we have to give replacement Bibles up. Let's make sure that we have the Bibles I approve of. So these Bibles were to be in use for the churches of his new capital, Constantinople, and were to be accepted to the mainstream of Christendom. These blend the contradictory versions existing at the time. Origin. Eusebius was born in Caesarea in Palestine. Eusebius later became the bishop there. That means he became the pastor of the church there in Caesarea. He was educated at Antioch. That means he was taught the truth. He was taught the right Bible. He was taught right doctrine. He was taught the truth. He got his training in Antioch, but he did his postgraduate work in the school of Caesarea that was founded by Origen. And so he went to the first cemetery there, I mean seminary, and he took all the teaching that was correct and threw it out the window, and it was replaced by some professor and scholar that taught him that his Bible was incorrect, that he needed a new one. Now, Eusebius is best known for his church history. He wrote a volume covering the time of Christ to Constantine. In fact, he was the first to record that time period in detail. So if you want to know about the period between the time of Christ and, and uh, Constantine, you're probably going to run into Eusebius's work. He was a historian. He did a lot. He, uh, Constantine was his hero. In fact, he was his guy who paid the bills, and we know the golden rule. We'll bring it up a couple different times. He that has the gold makes the rules. And so if your boss wants you to make something that's favorable to him, guess what you're going to do? You're going to make something that's favorable to him. He loved Constantine and tried to look, make him into a great light. Eusebius presided over the famous Council of Nicaea, which is the first one that Constantine had called to order. He was semi-Aryan. Now, what does that mean? 
That means his view on the deity of Christ was the same as the Jehovah's Witnesses, that he believed that Jesus Christ was a God in the sense that he was of like essence of God, but he was not God. So this is the guy who's translating Bibles, is the guy who doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is God. That's probably a problem. This line of thought <laughs> that influences the men who produced the Bible that gave us uh, the NIV and other modern texts. We also know that there's a different line of thought that influenced the men that gave us the received text or our King James Bible. Let's kind of define it. One line believes that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. The other group of people believe that Jesus Christ was a good man who had something of God in him or about him. Now, those two different lines of thought are going to produce two different lines of Bibles. Now, this line of thought of Jesus being partially God or something of God, but not God himself, this is why the new modern versions take out the word Lord, the word Christ, and the word Jesus hundreds of times within their text because they do not recognize that Jesus Christ is God. In fact, there's some text in there where they, instead of saying that, that God came in the flesh, they would change that a little bit and make it that Jesus was not God who had come down in the flesh. They would change those texts inside of the modern Bibles. Eusebius was an admirer of origin. He personally collected 800 of Origen's writings. Now, remember, books are not popular there. They don't have an Amazon. They don't have a printing house that you would have someone to have to hand write this. So for him to have 800 different books of Origen is a very big deal. He very much was influenced by Origen and his writings. Constantine gave Eusebius the imperial authority and the finances to produce these 50 Bibles. They were copied on the finest volume in codex form using unsealed letter. Hey, about a month ago, you would have no clue if I had said that what that meant. Now we do, that they were copied on the finest vellum, vellum in codex form using unsealed letter. The work was completed about 330, or 331 A.D., Many scholars have concluded that the Codex Vaticanus, which is the text of Tischendorf and West Cotton Hort, which we'll cover a little bit later, these are the people that all the modern versions are based off of, was one of the uh, 50 Bibles produced by Eusebius. Now, this again is one of those Alexandrian texts. Now, if you don't mind, look at its name again, Codex Vaticanus. That would seem to imply that it very much favors the Roman Catholic Church. It is this Codex Vaticanus, which is the inspiration, the backing of these other Bibles. So when the people of the NIV came to Acts chapter 8 and verse number 37, they said, well, the Codex Vaticanus doesn't have this verse. Let's go with that one. They made that willful choice. Scholars also think that the Codex Sinaiticus was not, if not one of these 50 Bibles, it was at least a direct copy of from them. And those are two of the Alexandrian texts. Remember, we have 54,000 texts that agree together, and we have three that disagree. In fact, they disagree with each other. Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, and I forgot the other one off the top of my head, but these are two of them. And so whenever they come to translate a modern Bible, when they come to a text they don't like, they could choose 54,000 that agree, or or 5,400 that agree, or three that disagree. Which one did you, oh, well, we like what this says better, so we're going to use this one. And that's how they came up with a lot of the renderings of the modern Bible. Again, I said there's 5,400 uh, <laughs> plus manuscripts available which to translate the Bible. The producers of the new versions ignored almost all of those manuscripts except for the two, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. They said, we like these renderings better. We like how they say it. We're going to put this in there. Now let's cover Jerome. We covered Eusebius. Let's now cover Jerome. His real name is Eusebius Sophanus Hyrenaeus. He decided to be called Jerome instead. People could use that. It's kind of like his stage name. He was one of the most learned and eloquent of the Latin fathers. 
Uh, he wrote a lot. He wrote very well. He was noted for his astenticism and his vanity. What do you mean vanity? Well, he was very accomplished. What do you mean accomplished? Well, he learned Latin and Greek in Rome. Um, so he learned those two languages, Latin and Greek. Then he learned Gaelic. And then he moved to Antioch and learned Hebrew from a converted Jew. So this is someone who doesn't just know these languages, he masters these languages. He's someone who knows languages, understand how languages work. He was someone who was an eloquent writer. He uh, did very well, which is again, remember, this is the ancient world. They don't have printing presses. They don't have Amazon. They don't. He's well-read, well-studied, knows all these languages. He is a scholar of scholars. He was ordained a presbyter, meaning the pastor, in Antioch. Imagine that. He went to Antioch and he actually became the pastor where he's teaching good doctrine. He's teaching good things. He's teaching what he's supposed to. Oh, and then something happened. This man had the opportunity to learn from Bible truths from the center of the New Testament church in Antioch, but he quit being a pastor of the church and decided, I want to be the secretary to the Pope in Rome. After all, he's very learned. The Pope said, hey, why don't you become my secretary? Write all my stuff. Make me sound good. Okay. And so he quit the good church to go be with the Pope. He began revising and translating in 838 or <laughs> 383 AD at the behest of the Pope who wanted a Bible that would better reflect his views, the Pope's views on God and Christianity. All right, so he begins to start writing, and the writing is supposed to reflect the Pope's views, not what he learned at Antioch, not what the Bible said, but to reflect the Pope's views. Following the death of Pope Damasus, uh, Jerome traveled to the Holy Land of Egypt, and eventually he settled in Bethlehem. While he was in Bethlehem, he built a monastery, but he finally passed away, never seeing his crowning work accepted. Let's study a little bit more about that. Jerome's Latin Vulgate, which again, he spent all of his life translating. He translated it from, uh, from the manuscripts into Latin because that was the common language of the time. So we want people to do it. The word Vulgate means common language. And so let's translate our view of the Bible into a tongue that everyone can study. In fact, it was not accepted for another 1,200 years. So he wrote this work. Nobody liked it thought it would get buried. He never thought it was going to be a success. In fact, the only time it was accepted is when the Jesuit order came into being, and they said, we like Je uh, Jerome's order. So if you know anything about Jesuit history, they were the militant arm of the Roman Catholic Church. They would come in and say, you either accept this or we kill you. What's your choice? Uh, well, I'll use this one then. And so that's how the Vulgate finally got accepted under pressure by the Jesuit arm. Jerome's translation was requested by the Pope to standardize the Latin text. There were a number of Latin versions being used at the time. Many of them were just perversions of the old Latin, which had been influenced by the Septuagint. And so he began to gather these in order, and let's try to make them match. It was written on vellum. He, Jerome, consulted the Hexapula and other works of Origen. Let's see what Origen has to say, and let's reflect our writings to see what Origen says. The whole thing was co uh, completed about 405 A.D. Now, he considered the Apocrypha books not to be Scripture. At least he was smart on that, meaning that the Roman Catholics have Apocrypha books that they sometimes see as Scripture. Jerome says, no, no, no. However pressure from the people that were financing him. Remember the golden rule? He that has the gold makes the rules. They said, no, no, we think this is scripture. Put it in your Bible. Okay. And the people from the palace at Rome, again, there's the pressure from people who have the gold. All right, I'll do it. Forced him to include Judith, Tobin, Bell of the Dragon, and additional chapters of the book of Esther. His translation was not readily accepted. He encountered fierce criticism from the clergy, even the priest of the Roman Catholic Church, for translating the Old Testament from Hebrew rather than their beloved Septuagint, which they had already embraced. Augustine originally rejected Jerome's Old Testament, but later on said, okay, I think we could use this. Augustine is very much the father of the Roman Catholic Church. So when he put a stamp of approval, it started to roll the right direction, at least for their idea. 
Jerome's work was rivaled by older Latin Bibles and did not gain any traction until the 8th century and never really caught on until the 1500s, again, because of the help of the Jesuits. The Christians from Antioch had taken the pure Bible and translated it into one language and one dialect, one after another, and went around the world preaching the gospel, making sure that the right Bible was given out that people could study it. Meanwhile, <laughs> while they were in Antioch, they believed that the church was a spiritual entity. What do we mean by that? That we believe that you have to be born again and that God's doing a spiritual work in this world. That you had to be born again and when you died, you could go to heaven. And that when the church age is over, what we're looking for is Jesus Christ is coming back to establish his earthly kingdom. Meanwhile, the other group believed that the church was a physical entity, that you got baptized into this physical entity, and that this physical entity had the responsibility to bring in the kingdom of God, and once they made the world perfect by converting it, then Jesus would feel comfortable enough to come back. So again, two different schools of thought, different ways of seeing the world, and each of these are going to produce two different Bibles. These people would then organize a crusade and march in the Holy Land and slaughter anyone they got in their way. Why? Because they're trying to bring in the kingdom on earth for Jesus. They have this idea, it is their responsibility to bring this kingdom in. Two different schools of thought that produce two different lines of Bible. Those that came out of Antioch with a pure Bible were preaching the gospel. They kept flourishing and kept prospering because of their faith in the word of God. Meanwhile, in 1547, the Council of Trent was held with all the religious leaders meaning all the religious who were invited. We know that the Catholics often have like Vatican II and whatnot. They invite all the religious leaders who are not Bible believers. And they get together and they all agree on that we see, believe the same thing and whatnot. But they didn't invite the Baptist. They didn't invite the other people. They didn't invite people from Antioch. But they had this big council with religious leaders. This council determined if you're not a member of the Roman Catholic Church or if you read the Bible... You are accursed and going directly to hell. That's at the Council of Trent, by the way. If you read your Bible, you're going to hell. That's always nice for a church to say. In addition, the Council of Trent declared Jerome's Latin Vulgate to be the official Bible of Europe. And so guess what? If you're a European, this is the Bible you have to use. You can't read it, though, but this is our Bible we're using. Okay. In 1522, the consumption polygot, that's a cool word, right? A polygot, by the way, is a term that means several different versions placed together side by side. I meant to bring one of my polygots. I love this Bible. It has four different versions put together in a row so you can actually see the changes in each one. That's great. But the, someone put together a polygot in 1522. This polygot was a revised Latin Vulgate along with the Greek text beside it and had several older manuscripts in the other columns. Stephen published a critical Latin text based off three Latin manuscripts, followed by a larger work based off that. You say, I don't care about that, and that's fine. But Stephen is important. Anybody know what Stephen did? It was Stephen who put together the chapter and verse divisions. Aren't you glad for that, that we know what John 3.16 is? But he was putting together uh, Latin uh, Vulgate, trying to update the work and trying to make it more uh, usable, at least by him. A revision based off the Latin Vulgate, the Hebrew and the Greek, was published by Pope Vulgate, the Hebrew and the Greek, was published by Pope Sixtus V. That's a cool name. Pope Sixtus V in 1590. Now, he had a problem. It was not well received. Why not? Well, during the last two years of his pontificate, they have cool names over in the Catholic land. So he rewoke, rewrote the entire Latin Bible, addressing phrases and verses and say, ah, I don't like this, don't like this, throw this out, let's fix that, whatever. And leaving out entire verses, changing the titles of Psalms, and invented his own system of chapter and verse divisions. It was a big mess. When the, uh, <laughs> in a papal bull, that's when they say we're making our declaration a papal bull, he declared by the fullness of apostolic power that his new translation of the Bible must be received and held as true. Thus saith the Pope. That's nice. 
When the clergy saw the Pope's astonishing handiwork, which instantly made obsolete the Council of Trent's approved Latin Bible and all the textbooks approved by it, they were horrified. Well, thankfully for Mo Holy Mother Church, the Pope died a few months later, and they did their best to cover that thing up and bury that and say, forget it. Another revision by Pope Clement VIII in 1592 did receive, receive acceptance. This Clementian Vulgate became the official Roman Catholic edition of the Latin Bible in 1604. And then the Reims Douay, which was based off Jerome in <coughs> 1582, became the official English version for the Roman Catholic Church. We'll cover that history later. But basically, when they saw that the English people were writing English Bibles, they said, we need to get a Catholic English Bible. And then they went ahead and published it, and then they outlawed anyone reading it, said anyone reading it's going to hell, and they locked it in a vault. That was nice of them. But that's the English version of the Catholic Bible today, is the Reims Douay Bible. That's the Catholic English Bible. Now, all of that is to bring us to this. We have now come to two different lines of doctrine, two lines of Bibles, two lines of thinking, and these two lines are going to be going the same direction. Years ago, someone gave me this illustration to kind of explain what is going on in the world in church history. And if you don't mind, I'd like to take this time to kind of explain and maybe get a better idea inside of you of what's going on and how things work in this period of history. So let's cover this idea of the night train to England. When Christianity surged out of Israel in the first century, it was unknown to the participants that it was headed inevitably to England, and from there it was going to reach the entire world. To accurately understand the direction of church history, you should imagine a, a map of Europe with a line drawn from Jerusalem to London. So if you can imagine uh, Jerusalem and a line straight to London, this is how church history is going to be flowing. And you're going to have two different lines that are going to be traveling the same direction. In 32 AD at the Council of Nicaea, the Church of Rome, corrupted by paganism, began to exert herself as the sole authority in the church. Thus, the Roman Catholic Church, as we know it, was created. And of course, we covered that before. Almost everyone accepts the precept that the Roman Catholic Church was the true representation of Christian, hist uh, Christian church throughout history. By the way, it is not, but every course you'll take on history is going to say it is. So therefore, anytime you study medieval history, you study church history, it is always going to bring up this travels of the Roman Catholic Church, and there's a reason for it. The result is, is that every church history course ends up being a study of the Roman Catholic Church. This includes Christian, Baptist history, whatever else. When you study the curriculum, it's going to end up referring to this church as the true church, and everything else is little small branches of it. While the course of the true church throughout history is basically ignored, in fact, they're studying on the Catholic Church. Now, someone explained this history like this. Imagine church history between 325 and 1500 AD is like riding on a train from Jerusalem to London, all right? So get in your mind, this is a train, okay? Now, the train is the Roman Catholic Church. The passengers on board the train are in a controlled environment. So imagine we've got a train, the train's the Roman Catholic Church, and you've got a lot of passengers on side. And by the way, there are many benefits to it too. All the passengers know of the environment they were passing through is through the limited view they could observe from their isolated location and whatever the conductor operating the train told them was true of their environment. So the people on the train, they'd never been off. All they could see is what they see in the window or what the conductor says about them. Hey, if you look over here, don't worry about... And they would only know what was told to them while they're traveling on the train. Meanwhile, true church history was being carried on elsewhere beyond the visual range of the train. So you got the train, the Roman Catholic Church. Then you have true church history that's off outside of view. But guess what? It is still traveling a parallel course. God was using his church on a separate but parallel course. It was not as sophisticated as the Roman train, but it is still moving steadily towards the same location, England. So kind of got this in mind, right? 
We got the train, nice and comfy, benefits. And then you got other church history that's prodding along. It's not as comfortable. It's hard. A lot of things in the way, but they're prodding along. But it's ignored because it's outside of view of the train. And everyone's focusing on the train. Now, although the Roman Catholic Church was not God's church, it still did have some good things going for it. Not everything about the train was evil. What was good about the train? Now, this is where we're going to try to explain the benefits of the train. So what type of things do we need to note about this train to England? All right, first of all, it had information. All the information was on the train. Because of its great wealth and power, the Roman Catholic Church became the repository for a large percentage of the knowledge of its day. It fanatically collected and stored all the books, all the scrolls, all the papers that it possibly could. It would take all of them and store them for themselves. Now, the main reason for them doing this was to keep the items out of the hands and the minds of the population for the purpose of keeping the people ignorant of the truth. So they figured if they had everything, they can control the information. Let's keep it away. But all the information is on that train. So regardless of that fact, all that information was on the train. And therefore, it was at a place where a free thinker on the train could inspect and form their own opinion than, than rather simply hearing the mindless <laughs> dictates of the totalitarian church. So basically, all the information is on the train. This is going to be something we're going to bring up here in just a second. All the information is on that train, and that train is traveling to, towards England. Now, this practice of having all the, all the information on the train was dangerous to the individual as it was the Roman church. More than a few have, been try, uh, have tried and killed as heretics for coming to conclusions different than what had been taught at Rome, but they could come to these conclusions because that information's on the train. Many times people may get a peek of this information, come to a different conclusion, and they get said, no, 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 you can't do this, and they would kick them off the train. Number two, what else was going on in the train? Their talents the talents that were found on the train. The Roman Catholic Church also wanted a monopoly of the great minds of Europe. They did much to cultivate and capture the loyalties of any outstanding mind. What does this mean? Well, in Europe, in the early days of the church, the society was stringently classed, meaning they had an upper class and they had a lower class. That was very much a very... Uh, stringent class. The common people were viewed by the nobility as little more than dogs in a social status, meaning they didn't mean anything, they didn't matter anything, they weren't important, they were just there. So these common people, they did not enjoy inalienable rights. They didn't consider to have their own rights. They were not offered education because nothing more is expected of them than a brute force or a brute strength. They were either going to be soldiers or they were going to be peasants. That was all they could amount to be. So no one looked out for them in their lives. They, they got trampled, they got trampled, no big deal. Their mental faculties were of no value because they were undeveloped and underused. They weren't, didn't go to school, they didn't learn things, they didn't exercise, all they had to worry about, can I survive another day? Can I survive another day? Those with strong intellects had to attempt to struggle out of this morass. They had to work hard to be identified, to poke out that there was something different about that individual. Now, if their star shone brightly enough, we want to make sure that their star is shining brightly and not dim, they would catch the attention of the Roman church and then be rescued by a stipend by some nobleman who could live their life in reasonable ease Why? pursuing their intellectual passion. So if you had someone that was really smart, what would happen is that the Catholic Church would identify him and say, oh, there's something to here. Hey, let's go ahead and take this guy. Hey, nobleman, can you take care of this guy and let him kind of uh, learn and take care of him? The Roman Catholic Church controlled most of the noblemen. All the noblemen belonged to the church. The noblemen then were a source of wealth and protection. Therefore, they were a natural light to draw the intellectual talent of Europe. So for a full stomach and reasonable safety, the Roman Catholic Church enjoyed a monopoly of the greatest minds in Europe, whether it was intellectual talent 
artistic talent, or any other discipline, they were all part of the Roman church. So that way they didn't have to work in the fields, they would work for the Roman church. Remember, he has the gold, makes the rules. So the priests in the local parishes would keep an eye for any outstanding minds within their jurisdiction. They would cultivate them and then bring these minds under the control of the Roman Catholic Church. So what you had is on the train, you had a gifted student program. That if you had someone that had, was a gifted student, you want to take them, identify them, separate them out, train them in the way you want them to be trained, and then allow them to have the freedom to work for you. They were able to get all the brains and put them in one place and were in control of them so that way nobody had any independent thought. If you were smart, you worked for the Roman Catholic Church. So sometimes people go back and claim, well, the scholars of, and the intellectuals of that day, well, of course the scholars of the intellectual days are going to defend the Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because they're all working for the Catholic Church. That's how you had to survive. Either you, if you were smart, you had to work for the Roman Catholic Church. Otherwise, you were a peasant or you were a soldier. The only dangerous thing is that with all the information and all the brains in one train, Someone is liable to get a hold of that information and use it. Now, there's a third thing on the train. There's comfort. Comfort. If a young man had outstanding talent and his parish priest would seek to give, gain him a living by having him move right into a nobleman's castle, the nobleman then provided him a living and in many cases, military protection. I don't have to worry about bandits. I don't have to worry about people stealing things. People, I'm protected. I can go ahead and do what I want. The nobleman then would pro profit from having the prestige of having an individual great talent residing under their roof. Guess what? I am the patron of Michelangelo. He works for me. Aren't you guys jealous? And that's what it would be. It would be the idea of status. Look at the smart people, the artists that I have working for me. Now, freed from the need to try to keep himself alive, the young scholar could completely devote his time and efforts to practicing his intellectual passion. By the way, I wish I had a patron. I wish I could get paid just to do nothing but read books and to write books. Man, that'd be great instead of having to work for a living and deal with other things. But that's not how it is for most people. So these people, when they were identified, they were protected and they could do whatever they want just as long as they didn't offend the people paying them. Okay. So this was far more attractive than being a cobbler, a beggar, or a tent maker. I meant, after all, if you don't have to work for a living, I'd rather study. I mean, you may not want to study, but I'd love to study. I'm painting to study, that's great. I'd be a full-time student, wonderful. For some people, that was an attractive deal. I'd take that. Now, if somebody wanted to be a student or an artist or anything like that, they would have to be, by default, Roman Catholic. If you look at the art and the literature of the Middle Age, you'll see a lot of Catholic iconology. Why? Because the Catholics are paying the bills and you have to make them happy. So if I have to write a picture that has some plump little angel with wings and makes them happy, then great, I'll do that. If I have to put a picture of Jesus where he looks like a hippie, and well, that's fine, I'll do that. If I have to write uh, Dante's Inferno and have all the Catholic purgatory, then let's do that. And so, hey, I get to do whatever I want as long as I keep them happy. This is great, I'll, no problem, good payoff. There's a fourth thing here. What else is on the train? Well-stocked libraries. In addition to good food, the train had a library. Sounds like a good train to me. There was absolutely no modern methods of travel or communication or copying books. Now, again, here in America, we have a hard time understanding this because we have an information age. You have a phone that you could look up anything you want, ended up looking cat videos. You understand that you have all the information of the world access to you. You have it available anytime that you want. We could turn on the TV. We could turn on radio. We have information overload. But back then they did not. They didn't have this. It was very hard to get a hold of a book. You did not have radio. You didn't have internet. To get information was a very big deal. Charts and scrolls were all produced slowly by hand, making them rare and expensive. To buy a book was very expensive because some guy had to take 
several years of his life to write it out by hand. That's a big deal. Hand cramps and all. So I finally get a book. I can't wait. I've been waiting two years for the guy to copy this for myself. Now I get to read it. It was a very big deal. A man could study independently, meaning outside of the Roman church, if these conditions were met. He would risk traveling through a war zone. Wars were always happening, especially in Europe between noblemen. So traveling was not very safe. He would have to be willing to risk his life in traveling. Between bandits, there was no protection. If you didn't have the protection of the Roman Catholic Church, to travel was very, very dangerous back then. In addition, he'd have to risk not finding lodging or food because there is no Dairy Queens, there's no Walmarts. Where am I going to eat? Where am I going to stay? Do I have a place to go? I want to go find this information. I hear it's over there. I'm going to travel. You don't have any of that. You can't book a room off of... Uh, Travelocity, you can't, you just didn't know what was going to happen. In addition, there was a risk of not being allowed to see the document. Imagine traveling all that way just to look at a document, and the guy says, Nope. Okay, what do I do now? So, if you wanted to study independently, there was a lot of hurdles to get across. But if you were on the train, all the materials are there. The libraries of the Roman church were well stocked and accessible with relative safety. All a man could want to know was there in that library on the train. So why risk the dangers going outside, going look for all this stuff when I have all the information I want right here? Scholars could pursue 90% of their own investigations without leaving Rome's comfort or security. Now, granted, because of the tainting of the information, the information would be somewhat inaccurate. It'd be skewed a little bit towards the Roman Catholic Church. But as long as they stayed on the train, they wouldn't even know there was anything different, nor would they care. So they were happy as long as they were safe, they were working, and they were producing. Why go investigate something else that's not here on the library? Why, not, why do I want to get off the train if I could be happy here? Does that make sense? Now, all the while, the true church was plodding along, not on the train, but on foot, out of sight. They had a truth that no library can contain. They were still mass producing the Bible and making sure people had it. The Roman Catholic Church was busy collecting a mere handful of ancient old manuscripts. The true church was busy producing thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of the Word of God and passing them out wherever they could so people could read God's Word for themselves. They didn't have time to write other books. They were busy trying to make sure the Word of God was getting out. There's a fifth thing here dealing with this train of why some of the benefits it had on the train. The other was the speed of travel, speed of travel. Now, traveling on the Roman Catholic Church was the fastest and safest way of advancement, meaning that a scholar who excelled and was loyal to the church, he would be advanced and rewarded. Man, if I don't have to struggle and people recognize how great I am, let's do that. I mean, every artist wants to recognize how great he is. Every scholar wants people to read their stuff. That, that's the way to go. One who stood out too much or asked too many questions or caused problems would be watched and be guided back into the fold by like a cattle prod or the rack or, you know, any kind of torture device to make sure that they stay within the lines. If that person was found to be too incorrigible, he'd be thrown off the train, which to them, remember the people on the train, if you were taught that you were going to be cut, tossed off the train, it would be a fate they considered to be oblivion. If you were tossed off the train, you were going to go to hell. In fact, there, we were mentioning the other day about Pope Innocent III. Pope Innocent III once had the Roman, Holy Roman Emperor outside in the snow barefoot kneeling for several days to get the Pope's attention because he did not want the Pope to excommunicate him and send him to hell. The Holy Roman Emperor People were afraid to get off the train because if I get off the train, I'm not going to heaven. That's a big deal. And so they were pretty motivated to stay up, shut up, color in the lines. Many times when they were kicked off the train, it ended up sending them over to the next hill and they would run into the true church and the true church would give them the information and they go, wow, I didn't know this. 
That happened several times where they would run into the truth after they got kicked off the train and said, this is what I was looking for. But even here, they were not safe. If they still caused problems on the other side of the hill, the Catholics would stop the train and go after them and then go kill the village and everything else. If they continued to make trouble for the Roman Catholic Church, they would be sought out and killed. Occasionally, the train was stopped, someone was put off, and sometimes violently. Kick them off the train, you can't get off, you're done. But when they stopped, sometimes new passengers got on. And when the new passengers got on, they brought with them hints of what was truly happening on that alternative route of history and started to say, hey, guess what's happening over there? Guess what's going on here? Something that's not happening here is over there. It's wonderful. And they would start to spread rumors and tell people about it. They introduced information and thinking processes that were both contrary and dangerous to the mental and spiritual monopoly of the Roman Catholic Church on the train. So what happens to the train? That's a good question. You got this train that's chugging along. It seems to be happy. What happens to the train? Well, remember, they've got dynamite on the train. They've got thinkers and they've got the information. And one day, the thinkers are going to find that information car and they're going to learn some things. The Roman Catholic Church met with names like Luther, Zwingli, and Erasmus. By the way, we're taking a whole session next time to talk about Erasmus. Outside of the Apostle Paul, it is my personal opinion that Erasmus is the smartest person who ever lived. We're going to talk about him in length next week. But the Roman Catholic Church met with Luther, and Zwingli, and Erasmus, men who knew down in their souls there had to be something going on beyond the sight of the windows of the train. There's something out there. I want to know more about it. Then the thing that the Roman Catholic Church feared would happen eventually happened. Martin Luther wrecked the whole train. He got a hold of the information and said, wait a second here. And he wrecked the train, and it was like a big gunfight, one of those old westerns where they kick him off the train, and he's holding on, and they kick him in the face, and he's bloodied, but he's still holding on, and bullets are firing all over, and he's still holding on. Finally, the whole train wrecks, and everything, and they never recovered from that. They tried to recover, but they never recovered from that train wreck. Now, when people refer to the church in history, or Christians, or Christianity, they are normally referring to the train not to the ones to the outside of the train that are heading in the same direction. Now, we're trying to explain to this because a lot of times when we run in church history, when you look at things, you're going to see things about the train and they never mention what's going on on the side, which is the true path of the church and the ones who are carrying the word of God and the protected line that is carrying. And they're both going to land in England and we're going to see what happens. Martin Luther wrecks the train. The whole thing crashes. The uh, true text gets to England and the true text spreads from England. Then the train in a wrecked mess finally comes in and they start bringing in the other text. And we'll cover about that in the next couple of weeks. But this was important to note, at least in our mind, to kind of see what is going on and how these two different lines that comes from two different thoughts and two different ways of thinking are going to arrive. One's were, one was trying to arrive in style. The other one was riding slowly, but surely it was hard path, but it got there. And that was the one that God used. If you don't mind, let's close out in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And Lord, my desire was not to bore the people. My desire was to try to clarify time to watch this message from the Riverview Baptist Church. If you've made a decision for the Lord, we would love to hear from you. Or if there's anything else we could do to be a blessing to you, please let us know. You could write us at Riverview Baptist Church, 216 North Main Street, Seymour, Wisconsin, 54165, or email us at git rbcinfo at gmail.com. You could also join us online for live and past messages on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, or our website, riverviewbc.com. You could also keep up with all the latest things going on at the Riverview Baptist Church by downloading our app. Search Riverview Baptist Church in your app store or text Riverview BC app to 77977. Thanks again for watching this message.